It's good to be here with you this morning. Um, we're in the, the third part of a four-part series about the Bible that Mark started a couple weeks ago. And, and if you missed those, those first two sermons, I highly recommend you going back and, and listening to them. They're available on YouTube. Um, they covered a lot of, of just why we, how we even got our Bible. And, and so this week, though, I get to talk to you about why do we need the Bible. And, and when Mark first gave this, this topic to me, um, I was really excited because um, I... If you don't know me very well, uh, I love to read and I love to learn, and and uh, that's what most of this is about is is, is theology and, and and just the, the stuff that's right up my alley. And so, um, really enjoyed uh, preparing for the sermon and 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 uh, and and this whole whole topic that we're doing. Um, when I was in college, I, I went to college in Missouri, and I, I'm from Michigan, and so I would travel back home um, by train quite a bit. I, I'd ride up here with, with Sarah, stay, stay at her family's house for the night, and then get on the train in Macomb and ride to Chicago and be in Chicago for about four to six hours. Um, and I just kind of walk around and talk to a bunch of random people, mostly homeless people, because um, those are the people that would actually talk to you. I'd get coffee, I'd read some books, um, do just random things for trying to kill the time, and then I'd get on the train and, and ride up to Michigan and um, stop in East Lansing where uh, um, my family would pick me up and we'd, we'd travel on the two hours north of there to get to get home so um, one of these trips I remember it was a Thanksgiving break I was going home and um, I was kind of running late to get back to, to the train station in Chicago and I wasn't quite sure where I was going um, because they moved the location of where I needed to be and so finally got all my stuff out of the locker and um, went and found where I was going to be and, and I was running late so I, I hurried up just found a random seat and sat down um, and, and pulled out a book uh, that I needed to read for class um, and it was a worldview and ethics class and the book was called Moral Choices and the guy sitting next to me looked over and, and said do you struggle with moral choices? And I answered, no, I didn't, and started reading again because I wanted to get, over the next three to four hours, I wanted to get this book done and read so I didn't have to read it again for class and you could just be done with it. He had a different idea. He decided that for the next three or four hours, we needed to talk about moral and ethical dilemmas that he, in fact, was facing. And so, um, I, and, and to be honest with you, when he asked me, do you struggle with moral choices, my answer should have been yes. Because I believe that we all struggle with moral choices. We all struggle with ethics, and we all struggle with, with just how to relate these things that we know to, to the world around us. And um, this week, I was, I, well, a couple weeks ago, I started reading uh, this article in Christian Post about uh, millennials. Uh, millennials are, are 18 to 36 year olds. I'm, I'm one of them. And uh, it said that 2% of professing Christians that are millennials have a biblical worldview. So, of millennials in the United States, 61% are professing Christians. Only 2% of that 61% have a biblical world view. And that's a problem. And that's a problem. And, and uh, so basically the, the, the question I have then is, what is a world view, right? We need to kind of figure out what that means. A world view is a commitment, a fundamental orientation of the heart that can be expressed as a story or in a set of presuppositions, assumptions which may be true, partially true, or entirely false, which we hold consciously or subconsciously, consistently or inconsistently, about the basic constitution of reality, and that provides the foundation on which we live and move and have our being. Clear as mud, right? We're going to break this down here in a second. One thing, though, that I want you to get before we continue on is that every single person has a worldview. It is what defines the way in which we interact with the world around us and the way we view the world. Well, what, we say, what we mean when we say worldview is a commitment, it's a spiritual orientation, more than simply a matter of the mind alone. It's a matter of the heart. It is the central defining element of the human person. Uh, when we say that it's expressed as a story, we, we, we're not saying that it is a story, but it's expressed that way. In the Bible, we look at you know, the story of creation. The creation was an event, but we talk about it as a story, the story of the fall of Adam and Eve. It was an event, but we talk about it in story form. Science does the same thing with, with evolution, and they talk about it in story form. Uh, it's, it's full of assumptions, presuppositions, things that we kind of look at, that, that we believe, that we come to. Um, presuppositions might be true, partially true, or false. There's a way that things are, regardless of how we see them, there's a way that things are. A chair is a chair, whether or not we recognize it as a chair. Either there is an infinitely personal God, or there is not. Sometimes we're aware of our commitments, 
and sometimes we're not. And sometimes our worldviews are inconsistent. Sometimes we, we think one way and we act another. Or sometimes within our worldview we have these two competing thoughts even that don't go together. There's assumptions made. There's a foundation. Our own worldview may not actually be what we think it is. It is rather what we show it to be by our words and our actions. Our actions might prove that we don't actually believe what we think we believe. If we really want to know about our worldview, we must learn to examine and reflect on how we actually behave. For example, do you believe in a God who deeply cares for you and intervenes in our world today? If you answered yes, I would say, well, then tell me about your prayer life. Because the way in which you interact with that God would, would tell me what you really believed about that God. Likewise, if you say there's a God, yet you live as though you are that God, do you really believe in a God? The worldview, like I said, is basically the core of what you and I believe. And it answers some basic questions about life. Okay, all worldviews do this. Regardless of what your worldview is, it answers these questions. The first question that it answers is, how did we get here? How did, we get, how did humanity come to be? Was it a creation? Or was it something else? What happened? The next question that it answers is, what is the meaning of human history? Where are we going? What is the meaning of everything that has happened up to this point and, and where are we headed in the future? And, and different worldviews will have different answers for these, these types of questions. The next one is, what is the nature of external reality? That is, the world around us. What is the nature of, of reality? Is it physical? Is it, is it just this physical world that we see around us? Is it just simply spiritual? Or is it a combination? Is it both physical and spiritual? What is prime reality? What is really real? What is the nature of God? Or, or what is the nature of a transcendent reality? Is there a transcendent reality? Every worldview will have an answer for this. And, and there's different worldviews out there. There's, there's, there's theism, which is, believes that there's a God. There's atheism that believes that there is no God. And, and there's basically pantheism that believes that all things are God, okay? Um, and, and so uh, all the worldviews kind of break down into, into those major characters, and there's, there's kind of branches within those and, and different things. Um, and there's three major theistic worldviews, and that's Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And they even have different answers for all of these um, questions as well. The next question that it answers is, what is the nature of truth? What is the nature of truth, and why is it even possible to know anything at all? And these questions drive even our sciences and different things as well. What is the nature of human beings? What does it mean to be a human? At the core of, of the debate on, on whether or not abortion should be legal or not, whether or not abortion is, is, is right or wrong, um, is this question right here. What does it mean to be a human? In her book, Love Thy Body by Nancy Percy, she deals with this, um, this dilemma of what does it actually mean to be a human. It's, I highly recommend reading this book. Um, it's very heady. But she breaks it down and says that, that basically uh, there's, there's different theories out there about personhood and when does life actually begin. And depending on your worldview depends on the way you answer that. It depends on whether or not you would agree with abortion or not. Basically, and, and not just that, but other, other uh, um, ethical issues and moral choices that, that go around as well. Next question is, what happens to human beings when they die? It, is, is this it? We live, we die, and, and that's it? Is there, do we, do we kind of reincarnate and become a different being? Or do we go and spend time, you know, heaven or hell, basically, are the, the answers with that. Um, how do we know what is right and wrong? What guidelines determine human behavior? What drives our ethics? All worldviews deal 
with these things. And I want to give you a couple of resources. I'm going to give you resources throughout just because uh, it's a lot to take in uh, and, and there's some great resources out there on, on studying these things and learning these things. Um, and like I said, I really love to learn and I love to read. And so um, I've, everything I'm going to give you, I've read. Uh, the first book is called The Universe Next Door. It's, a, it's an introductory study on worldviews. Um, it's been written by a man named James Sire. And in that book, he wrote this. He said, so as long as we live, we will live either the examined or the unexamined life. And my challenge to you today is to live an examined life, to, to, to ponder these questions and to think about these things and what really, really drives you. The other book is called The Truth About Worldviews. It's a much smaller book, much easier to read. You could read it in an afternoon, no problem, because it's, it's less than 100 pages long. So um, these are two great resources. I'd highly recommend picking them up. The Universe Next Door, I think, is on like its sixth edition. It's constantly getting updated um, based on the culture around as well. And so, um, you know, basically we need to understand that we are who we are. We are not what people think or say that we are. We are who God says that we are. Um, and and if, there's, if there's only 2% of the 61% of, of professing millennials that are Christians um, out there that actually have a biblical worldview, we need to understand, okay, what is a biblical worldview? Because to be honest with you, the older you get doesn't get much better. Boomers that are professing Christians, only 9% of them have a biblical worldview. Uh, so what is a biblical worldview? A biblical worldview believes these things. First, that there is absolute moral truth that exists and it is defined by the Bible. A biblical worldview would tell us that there is absolute truth and it is defined by the Bible. The next one is that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. If you have a biblical worldview, you believe this statement. The third is that God is all-powerful and all-knowing, that he is the creator of the universe and he still rules today. He's still on his throne and he interacts with uh, his creation a biblical worldview would also believe that salvation is a gift from God and cannot be earned. There is nothing that you and I can do to earn our salvation. It is a free gift to God that only He gives. It is by His grace and His mercy that we even get to, to be here together with Him in that. And so salvation is a gift of God. That's what a biblical worldview would believe. The next thing is that Satan is real. As, as Blair read, read that quote earlier about, about angels, the same thing about Satan. That Satan is a real being. A biblical worldview would believe that a Christian has a responsibility to share their faith in Christ with other people. Basically, that, that's saying that we should evangelize. If you have a biblical worldview, you believe that you need to evangelize and you need to save lost souls. You need, you need to be a part of that um, in that. So uh, the next thing is that the Bible is accurate in all of its teachings. The Bible is accurate in all of its teachings. And there's, there's a few resources there as well that I want to give you from the, mainly from the Barna Group. The Barna Group uh, does a lot of research in, in the culture around us and, and gives us a lot of, of information in that. And, and uh, part of that, David Kinnaman and George Barna have written some books together and some separately. And the first book is called Unchristian. Um, uh, the next book is You Lost Me, and then there's also this book called Churchless. And all three of these books kind of deal with, um, with what people view Christianity as, how they interact with Christianity, and why people are leaving the church uh, altogether as well. I'd highly recommend all three of these books. Um, they're, they're not hard reads either, um, they're, but they're all fantastic uh, reads. And in understanding more about the biblical worldview and how it relates to the world around us and to the culture that we are in. And so the, the last thing that we, we said on that was that the Bible is accurate in all of its teachings. And so I want to talk about what do we actually believe about the Bible. If we're going to talk about why the Bible is needed, what, are we gonna, what do we actually believe about the Bible? And the first thing uh, we do, uh, we, we call this collection, this, this Bible, we call this collection um, a Bible or a canon. The Bible is from the Greek word biblos, meaning book. And since it's one collection, we call it a canon because... In Greek, that means the measuring rod or norm. R.C. Sproul said, to call the Bible the canon of Scripture is to say its 66 books together function as a supreme measuring rod or authority for the church. 
Now, when I was, um, I was younger, I was living in Michigan, uh, my dad decided to build a shed one, one summer, and I remember helping him out with that and, and being able to use the power tools and stuff. I thought it was an awesome thing. I remember my dad said, okay, I want you to cut these two by fours to this certain length. And so I remember measuring one of the two by fours, and I, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna get this job done quicker and easier, how can I do that? Um, because one thing he told me was work smarter, not harder. Um, and, and so I, I laid out all these boards on, on these, uh, um, the, the, the saw horses, and I measured the first one and I cut it, and I took that one, and I measured the next one, and I cut it, and I took that one, and I measured the next one, and I cut it, and I just kept doing that. And you know what happens if you continue to do that? Your boards get shorter, right? Because, because what I used to measure it wasn't the right length all the time. So your boards get shorter and shorter and shorter to where they are no longer usable. Yeah, I, did, yeah, I learned an important lesson that day, the old adage, measure twice, cut once, right? Now when we're studying the Bible, we need to take our time. We need to measure twice and cut once. We need to think about the things that we are doing. You think about what we're using and what we're looking at. When we use um, anything other than the Bible, you know, things like our, our favorite uh, internet preacher or, or what a certain philosopher states, what the Bible study curriculum says, and we use that as um, more than simply a tool to help us study, and we begin to follow those things first, then we have lost sight of the measuring rod and we begin using the wrong board. Our springboard needs to be Scripture. And through all those centuries of revelation, God was inspiring the words of Scripture in such a way that writers were revealing a greater message than they themselves could clearly see. Every written word of the Old Testament highlighted humanity's need for, li for a living word who is yet to come. Mark first gave me the sermon and I was like super excited because I, I'm really passionate about, okay, we need, to, we need to understand the Old Testament to, to understand the New Testament. And I, that was gonna be, I was going to build my whole sermon around that. And then I remembered, oh yeah, you guys just got done studying the book of Hebrews, which basically does that for you. So I was like, yeah, that, that's not going to work because you don't need to study the book of Hebrews here in 30, sec 30 minutes again. Um, and so kind of moved on from that. But understanding that the entirety of Scripture works together to paint this one picture and our need for the living word who's yet to come. And so what do we believe about the Bible? The first thing is that it is inspired. And Mark spent a great deal of time last week talking about this, and so we're not going to really talk about this. We just need to understand inspired means God breathes. God breathed. And so if you want to learn more about this, I suggest you watch last week's um, sermon on YouTube. The next thing is that it is infallible. And infallible fallible literally means unable to deceive or not liable to err. It, says, it means that that which cannot fail. Scripture tells the truth and it never deceives us. That's what we believe. When we come to the Bible, we say, okay, Scripture um, does not lie to us. It tells the truth. We also believe that it is inerrant. That it means without error. This does not require Scripture to be scientifically precise. And inerrancy certainly doesn't rule out figurative language or numeric estimates in the Bible. God revealed his message through human authors who recorded truthful testimony in different genres and different styles of writing to whatever extent precision was necessary to express God's truth. Scripture tells the truth with precision. We also believe that Scripture is sufficient. And what we mean by that is that it provides us with sufficient knowledge to trust God and to live in fellowship with him. The, sufficient, the sufficiency of scripture, it, it doesn't mean that the Bible includes every truth we will ever need to complete every task in our lives. Scripture is sufficient to show us to do all things for the glory of God with the mind of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we get this uh, in two ways. Okay, we, we, we believe in this idea of revelation. Revelation is simply making plain or an unfolding of that which is hidden at one point. And the first thing about revelation is uh, that we believe in general revelation. General revelation is given to everyone. Psalm 19.1 tells us that, uh, it, that, that the, the psalmist writes that I can know who God is just by looking at the vastness of the universe. I look at nature and, and the world around me and I can understand that there's something that designed this. In Romans 1, 19 through 20, Paul tells us that, that it was written on the hearts of men, that everyone is without excuse to knowing that there is a creator. 
It does not give us details about redemptive, God's redemptive work in history, but it does communicate and does give us a true and clear knowledge of God's character in that. The next thing that we learn is, is a special revelation. Special revelation tells us what God's redemptive plan is. It gives us specifics about the incarnation and, and the cross and the resurrection. These are things that, that cannot be learned by simply looking at the world around us. It's special. It's given directly to us. And that is what the Bible is, what the prophets were doing and the apostles were doing. That's what we believe about it. And so um, the, the question is what, is, what are we going to do with this? What does all of this actually mean for us? If we believe this about the Bible and we, we know these things to be true, what does this mean? Well, first thing is we, it's, it's the study of theology. It's basically what we're talking about. Theology is uh, broken down from this word logos, which means word or idea. We get the word logic from it. Uh, so biology, it would be like the study of life. It's the word or the logic of life. Anthropology, you know, study of man and human, humanity, would be the word or the logic of humans. And it also comes from the, the Greek word theos, which is God. And so whenever we speak about God, we are engaged in theology. And just like every person has a worldview, every person is a theologian, regardless of what we believe. The goal of theology the goal of theology is to draw out the teachings of the Bible and understand them. Rather than forcing philosophy or our assumptions into the Bible, we begin with trying to understand what God is communicating to us. Sam Harris is an atheist that wrote a book called The End of Faith um, that I recently uh, listened to. And in it, his whole premise is, is trying to say that we don't need faith anymore. We just need science. Uh, science is sufficient and, and faith um, doesn't matter. But as as um, the authors of I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist says, even that is a faith system. Regardless of whether or not you're an atheist, you're a pantheist, you're a theist, you have a faith system. And you are a theologian in a sense um, because everyone has faith. Because science can't answer every single question about the universe. At some point it requires faith. Much like everyone has a worldview, everyone is a theologian. So why does it matter? Why does that matter? Well, we have kind of have, um, uh, you see, sometimes we kind of run from theology a little bit because it, it can be hard to understand. For example, the, the Trinity. The Bible doesn't come out and say specifically that there's a Trinity, but it alludes to and it talks about these three beings. And so, and so how do we understand this, this idea? It's hard for us to wrap our heads around um, and attempt to explain it because sometimes it, it seems to... Uh, border on heresy when we do that. And so rather than continuing to study systematic theology, we throw our hands up and we say, I just need Jesus in my life. However, that is a theological statement and theology is unavoidable for every single person, specifically Christians. We practice theology whenever we think or speak about God. We are doing theology when we pray, when we worship, when we read scripture, when we teach others about the faith and make decisions about how to live in a right relationship to God. And in this sense, every Christian, Christian practices theology every day. And even if a Christian has never engaged in, in formal theological study, he or she, we all operate with a functional theology at every moment of our lives. Our functional theology consists of our default assumptions about who God is, what God is like, and how God actually relates to us. These assumptions... They work in the background of our thinking and, and, and our, within our speaking about God. They affect every claim that we make about God because we filter every word we apply to God through them. And that sounds an awful lot like what a worldview is. See, when we're practicing theology, it's through the lenses of our worldview. And too often we kind of take these human understandings and we apply them to God. For example, in the book uh, Love Wins, Love Wins uh, the author Rob Bell misunderstands God's love throughout his book by using what you and I would deem as love you know, and saying, okay, this is love and this is not love. We, we, for example, would say that a good God wouldn't let good people suffer. And yet that's exactly what God seems to do. So perhaps our understanding of what is indeed a good God is not the same as what God would deem is a good God and how a good God would actually act. And so in his book, Love Wins, Rob Bell um, makes the premise that, that God's love will win out and that no one is actually going to hell 
And it doesn't matter what you believe, you're going to end up with God for all of eternity. Francis Chan and Preston Sprinkle uh, decided to write a book called Erasing Hell. Highly recommend reading. Um, and, and they look at the New Testament and they say, yeah, that's not true. You see, Jesus talks more about hell than any other person in the Bible. And so if Jesus' love wins out, like how, does that, how do those two competing thoughts work together for what Rob Bell is reading? And, and so he, they write this book and, and to, to combat this, this very prevalent idea in our world today about this. That most shifts in biblical thought don't come from necessarily from new discoveries, but rather from new philosophies that appear in the secular world. And we then uh, attempt to synthesize those modern philosophies with an ancient religion. You know, we sing this, this song, ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. It, it's, it's hard to take something that's modern philosophy and, and, and apply it to, to uh, an ancient religion that just don't go together. And so why do we have a need for theology? Jack Cottrell in his book, um, The Faith Once for All, says we need theology for, for sound exegesis. Exegesis is how we study the Bible. Exegesis means that we look at the Bible and we say, okay, what is God trying to communicate to me through his word. Rather than sitting around saying, okay, well, I think this is what this is, or I feel like this, that's eisegesis. That's us putting ourselves into that. That's taking our presuppositions and our assumptions and saying this is how God would act. Exegesis tries to do the opposite and say, okay, how does God act and what does that mean for me in my life today? The next thing he says is it's a safeguard against error, heresy, schisms in the church, and cult building. When we, when we understand theology, uh, we understand this. The, the apostles, the, the early church did this. We can read about this in Acts. Um, they had a, a conference in Jerusalem. They got together and they said, okay, what are we going to do about this teaching? There's, there's certain teaching we're not sure about. What are we going to do about it? And they looked at what the scripture said. This has happened throughout history as well. When different heresies have, have shown up, the church gets together in these different councils and they say, okay, what does the Bible teach about this? And they look back at that. It provides a safeguard when we have theology, when we practice theology. It provides proper foundation for valid Christian experience. If what you claim to experience doesn't match up with, Christ, with, with Scripture, I'm going to lean on the side of Scripture every time. Uh, it's also a foundation for our growth spiritually as well as our character. Uh, having good theology means that we can grow um, spiritually. The next is the only sound basis for morality and ethics. And, and in the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, they cover this greatly. Um, I, like I said, I highly recommend you can, you can listen to the audio book or, or you can read it. Um, it's a great book, but, but it's the only sound basis, basis for morality and ethics. He also says that we're commanded um, to give attention to doctrine. When we have better theology, our practice of Christianity is simply better. R.C. Sproul says, when God speaks, every detail he utters has an impact on every other detail. That is why our ongoing task is to see how all the pieces fit together into an organic, meaningful, and consistent whole. And so the question then is, what does this actually mean for you and me? How do we apply this, what, we, what I just talked about, having a proper worldview, proper theology, to our lives? Well, in, in 1521, Martin Luther um, at the, said this, unless I am convinced by the testimony of scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in the councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. Since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience, I cannot do otherwise. And here I stand. May God help me. Amen. Basically, what Martin Luther was doing was saying that Scripture is above anything else when it comes to theology and truth. He was saying that the, the church traditions that, that we follow, if they do not fall in line with what Scripture teaches, I'm going to land on the side of Scripture every single time. And that's why, like last week, when Mark was talking about the Apocrypha, uh, that it, it, it played into all of this as to why we, why we believe that the Apocrypha shouldn't be a part of the Bible and, and how some doctrines entered into the church as well. The Restoration Movement, which Burnside Christian Church is a part of, um, began out of the Reformation, out of the Protestant Reformation that Martin Luther began with this statement. Um, basically, the whole point was to get back to what the Bible says. 
Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone kind of teamed up together. They left the Presbyterian Church. Um, they were doing their own movements, came together, um, and created this restoration movement. And they said that while you know a river is, is purest at its source, so too is Scripture. And so when we go to theology, when we study theology, we need to first and, and know and understand our Bibles. We need to go to the Bible. And much of the New Testament was actually written to correct theology in the early church. Paul writes the book of Galatians because there were some people in the church that are known as Judaizers that, that told the Gentile Christians that they had to first become Jews before they could become Christians. And the measuring rod for that was circumcision. And Paul uses some pretty strong language. And he says, you know, I wish they would just emasculate themselves. He's like, they've, they've got it wrong. Anything plus Jesus is not the gospel. And so he was correcting theology. John, in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, writes those letters to the church to, to correct this idea of Gnosticism that says that Jesus wasn't a god, he was a demigod. And so he wrote these letters to correct that, that thinking. Paul does the same thing in 1 Corinthians. He, he writes to, because there's a whole lot of issues going on there. And so he writes these letters to, to correct that theology and to, and to keep people from being led astray. And, you know, I had a, a, a recent encounter with this myself. I was studying for my master's degree several years ago when I was at the camp. And I remember I was upstairs studying, and my wife Sarah was downstairs watching TV. And, and I went down and I said, Sarah, Sarah, I think I'm an open theist. And she's like, okay, well, what is that? And, and as she does, she patiently listened to me um, explain why I thought I was an open theist. Um, and then she said, okay, and probably went back to watching TV. And I went back up to doing my study as I was writing this paper on open theism. And the more I studied, the more I realized, I was like, oh, I'm definitely not an open theist. Um, because what, what I found out was that open theists basically believe that God doesn't necessarily know the future. That's, that's the basic underlying argument. And, and what they do is they take Scripture and they kind of begin to distort it a little bit. And, and they don't look at all of Scripture. They only look at the ones that they, that they like. And, and, and they begin to kind of distort it. And they, they kind of take that measuring rod, that, that original board that was, that was supposed to be a certain length, and they take that and they use that to measure the next board. And, and it gets shorter. And we get further and further away from what the truth actually is. I'm not an open theist. And I hope that none of you are as well. But that's exactly what Satan does. He asks us, did God really say that. And all the while, he changes out the measuring tape with a pre-cut board and takes us slightly further from the truth. See, the Bible is much more than a simple narrative of events for us to interpret on our own. The Bible gives us the record of what actually happened along with the authoritative interpretation of the meaning of those events. Scripture doesn't simply tell us about the truth, but rather it is the truth. It is, in fact, the divine revelation. It doesn't just give us the Word of God, it is the Word of God. We allow the Bible to interpret the Bible, and we can see that the Bible is a cohesive unit. And in Matthew 7, 24-27, Jesus teaches that, the, that what separates the wise builder from the foolish builder was how they responded to the teachings of Jesus. And so I want to talk to you about the goal of theology a little bit, and what it is that we're doing. In 1 Peter 3, 14-16, it says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear for the, their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. You know, these Christians were facing some pretty hard realities during some unbelievable persecution. And Peter reminds them that even in the midst of all of that, to be prepared to tell people why you're willing to go through all the turmoil. He tells them that, that first you, you need to sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. He says, be certain that Jesus is Lord of your life and affirm your utterance, your, your utterance and dependence upon him. Is Jesus first and foremost in your life? If not, you need to sanctify your heart and place him there. He also says to always be ready, to know God's word. And this is what Jesus did when he was tempted by Satan in the desert, when he was accused by the Pharisees, and when he needed encouragement. Jesus turned to the truth of the scripture. And as I was sitting on that train with that man named Bruce, that, that, that one uh, November day, as we're traveling through, I needed to be prepared in what I believed about morality and ethics to give him hope in a future for his own life. 
It says also to make a defense. Always keep the discussion focused on Jesus and his finished work on the cross. He says to everyone who asks you, pray that God would give you the opportunities to share your faith in this culture. People may look at your life and ask why you can be hopeful in the midst of trial. Now, when Jairus was first born and, and we were down in the NICU in, in, in Springfield, uh, the, this, this woman came over to us. She had some kids there as well. And, and she came over to us and, and she asked, Jairus, or asked Sarah and myself if, if we would have aborted our son if we had known that he had Down syndrome. And, and we both just said, no, we wouldn't. And then my wife patiently and lovingly explained why. Uh, explained our, our theology and, and our approach to what humanity is and what a human is using the Bible. And it left her, hopefully, with some hope as well in her own life. And so we need to be prepared to everyone who asks us to give an account for the hope that is in you. It is your relationship with the living God that is the source of your power and strength. And yet with gentleness and reverence, Paul, uh, Peter says, show patience, respect, and love as you talk. So we always need to be ready. And that is why we need to have a, a theology, good theology in our lives. In Isaiah chapter 1, the nation of Israel uh, was good at practicing the religion without actually allowing it to penetrate their hearts. They knew what God wanted from them. And they, they co complied with all the traditions that were laid out before them. But God was not pleased with what he did. And using Isaiah to speak to the people, God actually calls the nation of Israel Sodom and Gomorrah. And so we read this. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires you, of this, who requires you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no more. Um, and no longer incense is an abomination to me. New moon and, and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. And although the practices of, the, of religion it was what God had told them to do. They, they were doing the right things. Their words and their actions once they left the temple were not. One author writes, this implies one of two life theologies. First, either their imagined God is Lord of religion and nothing else in their lives, or such a God does not appear to care about anything else and finds their everyday lives acceptable. Yet Yahweh, who's, who is God, another name for God, tells Isaiah that such a lived theology insults and disgusts him. It renders all their religious conformity and orthodoxy offensive. They have misunderstood Yahweh by not mirroring his heart, thus turning all their actions and words into corrupted religion. When we approach theology in a way that it doesn't actually penetrate our heart, and it doesn't change our lives, we are doing the exact same thing the Israelites did. We practice the letter of theology without the heart behind it. We paint everything as either black or white. We become militant in our approach to Christianity, making sure that everyone conforms to our way of thinking rightly without taking into consideration the individual. We must be right and they are wrong. Christianity at that point becomes divisive. And it is not pleasing God. In fact, it disgusts him. And in Isaiah chapter 1, he says, I am no longer listening to your prayers. And so we need to make sure that when we approach theology, we're doing it in a manner that is pleasing of God that will actually change our lives. And that's what happens in, in the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is there and they're building the walls, rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem at, and the temple with Ezra after uh, the Babylonian captivity. They were allowed to go back and do that. And, and in, in Nehemiah chapter 8, when they get to the end of this, they, they pull out the scroll and they begin to read this. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, it says, Then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who were the people who, who taught in the, seminary, or in, the, in the temple, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. 
They heard these words and they were like, oh man, we're not doing what, what, what we're supposed to be doing. And it broke their hearts. They were repentant of that and they were sad. And then he said to them, go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people. Um, so the Levites calmed all the people saying, be still for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. All the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. And when we allow the words of Scripture to penetrate our hearts, and we allow it to change within us, and when we are confronted with the truth of Scriptures, we will repent and we will change our ways. The people realized that they had not been following the law or the commands. They longed to worship God, but they weren't doing it in the manner in which God it had instructed them to do. And so their worship was there. That is, they had the right heart about it, but their practice was off. And their response when they, when they learned this was to repent. They continued to celebrate what we now know as the Feast of Tabernacles, as was required by the law. And their faith and their theology came together and joined together. And Paul in Acts 17 is, is, is walking through this area and he sees, he sees that they have several shrines set up for different gods. And they see this one god, this one shrine for this, this unknown god. And he, he begins and he calls them, men, you have men of faith. You guys believe in, in, in stuff out here. You have great faith. But let me tell you about this unknown god that you have. And he begins to tell them about Yahweh. He begins to tell them about God of the Old Testament and, and what he's done through human history and what he did with Jesus. And some people mocked and sneered them, but some people believed when they learned of the resurrection of Jesus. And so, uh, so we, we can basically um, look at this. And, we, and, and James Sire says, you know, the unexamined, or so as long as we live, we can either live the examined or the unexamined life. In the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, they say the unexamined faith is not worth believing. And so my, my challenge to you is to begin to examine your faith to begin looking at scripture and, and begin understanding what it is because theological learning is pursued rightly when it occurs within the context of a life of discipleship because the practices of discipleship enable and enrich a pursuit of the theological knowledge. And this is an excellent book called Theology as Discipleship that I recently read and I highly recommend picking it up as well because it, it talks about, about how we actually live out the theology that we believe in our lives. And just as the people in Isaiah were concerned with tradition, we must always be careful to make sure that we are being attentive to all of Scripture. Our study of the Bible should build our relationship with God. And he can... Um, and, and our worship is shaped and, and sanctified individually and together corporately as we discover the living God and what he reveals uh, as he reveals himself to us through his word. Our theological dialogues, the way we talk about God should be rigorous, they should be authentic and they should be humble with others and the God in which we are dialoguing with and about. We have to be careful not to make theology something that is simply observed. God is not over in the corner that we just simply examine him, but rather our understanding of theology must move us in worship of the one in which we are studying. See, biblical faith is the response to God's revelation. Our faith grows as God is more revealed in our life. And God speaks and acts, and then God's people respond in faith. And that is why we need the Bible in our lives. Will you stand and pray with me? Father God, I just thank you so much for um, just the truth that you have for us in Scripture, for, for uh, the life that you've given us. Thank you that you are not a God who, who has just left us alone, but that you are a God who, who interacts with us, who longs for us to, to, to know you better and to grow in our faith. So, Father, I pray that we become a people who, who take that faith seriously, that as we continue to grow, we just focus in on who you are and, and how you want us to be and who you have made us to be. So thank you for all that you do in our lives. In your son's name I pray. Amen. You are dismissed and you are loved. Have a great week.